no. Well, all right, everybody. Uh, we hope uh, hope the folks watching at home had a good time seeing the announcements there, and glad to have you guys here. We got a new table being sat at by more than one person. Miss Linda, thank you for starting a trend over there. It's good to minister to Miss Chris over there and let her kind of get out of her shell. She's so reserved and quiet and never talks to nobody. So, you know, <laughs> we're glad to get together to come and study God's Word together this evening. Um, there's all kinds of great things going on. Um, we will have a short meeting after our time together. If you're interested in, in sticking around to uh, help us plan and, and kind of dream about what our Easter event for our community will be like uh, in about a month, we're going to have that first meeting this evening. So, uh, so stick around. It's not, it's not by invitation only, and if it is, you just got invited. So come be a part of that. If you're at home, or come on down uh, for that meeting. Come on. We'd love to have you. Uh, let's start off with a word of prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll get into Mark chapter 7. Father in heaven, Lord, you are so good to us. God, you're better than we deserve, to say the least. God, you're not just better than we deserve. You are the best we could ever imagine and then some. Lord God, I praise you and I thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, your grace, your salvation, and the ministry that you call us to. God, I thank you, Lord, that you choose to include me, these folks in this room, and all that would believe to come and be a part of your kingdom, to work, to serve, to do our very best to glorify you with all that you've given us. God, I thank you, Lord, that, that we continue to learn from your word, and we ask that you teach us even more this evening as we look at the next part of the next chapter of the, of the Gospel of Mark. Speak to us, God. Encourage us. Equip us. Lift us up. Motivate us, Father, to serve you with all that we are. We love you, Lord, and we thank you most for Jesus, who makes all of our relationship with you possible. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in Mark chapter 7 and uh, going to get into some more of Jesus' teaching and, and uh, all kinds of great things. I'll tell you, I, you guys have probably noticed that uh, I'm going a little bit longer on Sunday mornings. I, the, first and Second Timothy has really got me fired up about a few things, and, and it's just been so good to be in those books. But I'm going to tell you, too, I've been enjoying studying through the Gospel of Mark. Um, as, as we've talked about before, as we did our introduction, Mark was is believed to have been the first of the Gospels actually written down and recorded, uh, used as a source for Matthew and Luke, and, and, uh, and certainly so much of what we know about Jesus comes from how God moved through Mark to, uh, to have these things recorded. So uh, just uh, it's always good to get back to the Gospels um, because it's, the, it's there that we learn about the connection <coughs> between us and God and that connection being the person of Jesus Christ. So we're going to take a look together, beginning with verse 1, and we'll go on through verse 23 there in Mark chapter 7. As we read that together, as we look, to, look at it together, as I read it, it says, The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. 
Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For, if, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Well, Jesus speaks to some church people in this part, doesn't he? <laughs> he is talking about the age-old issue of faith versus tradition. Now, sometimes faith and tradition are absolutely merged and need to be. But oftentimes, in all kinds of things, our tradition overtakes even sometimes common sense, and oftentimes it overcomes the things that God's trying to teach us and tell us to do. Now, I don't know about y'all, and we, I think I've used this as an illustration before, but it's so true in my life. I am a creature of habit. Are you a creature of habit this evening? <laughs> I am a creature of habit. Um, I, and, and like silly, like, oh, I, I don't... OCD is a real thing, obsessive compulsive disorder, so I don't want to, I don't want to trivialize it. Uh, I don't think I have that. I've not been diagnosed with that, but I have some very, very routine things that I do. For instance, I brush my teeth in the exact same way every time I brush my teeth. Do you do that? Okay. All right. I, I, thank you. I'm not a freak. I, I said, thank you, Jana. Uh, I mean the exact same time. I won't describe that to you for fear that you might think that's all he's brushing his teeth, but... I mean, this same situation, um, you know, I would say I comb my hair the same way every time, but you know, that's just a made up thing. Uh, so, but I'm telling you, I brush my teeth the exact same way. There have been times where I've had an injury to a finger or a hand, you know, my right hand, and I've had to brush my teeth with my left hand. And you thought the world was upside down. I mean, I, that just didn't work for me because I'd try to do the same motions in the same order and it was just all off, you know? Um, so many things. I, you know, there's just simple things that, that, you know, like brushing your teeth, that, that we're creatures of habit. We do the same things over and over again. Sherry will tell you, and again, I've used this as, a, as an illustration. By the way, Sherry is the best wife a, a man could ask for. Uh, and only one of the many reasons that she is that is this, is that uh, when I got out of high school, uh, I went to work in Key Largo, Florida, where my dad was living at the time. And, and I was working in a little shell. It was called the Shell Man, a little tourist trap down there. And, and you guys, some of you have heard the story. I, you know, they had a room about half the size of this room with all kinds of tables and shelves. And, you know, there was nothing but T-shirts. Well, you know, as us tourists, and I, I are one now, I can, I can relate a little bit more now. I used to, can't, I couldn't stand it, but now I do it. Uh, but they'd come in and they'd want the T-shirt off the bottom of the stack. So what would they do? They'd pull the whole stack out and they'd all fall out. And they'd just be like, oh, no, I don't want that one. They wouldn't buy anything. They'd go on. Before we left every night from the Shell Man in Key Largo, Florida that summer, we had to fold every single t-shirt and have them ready for the next day. Now, forget the fact that we had to have them ready for the same stupid tourist to come in and do the same thing to them again, and we'd be folding the same t-shirts. We sold some t-shirts, but not near as many as we had. And we had to fold them in that store way of doing it. You know what I'm talking about? They've got the, the, the video about the, the Asian person who can do it so quick. I could not do it quick, but that's the only way I could fold T-shirts at that place. That became the only way, even at this point now, 26 years later, that I will fold a T-shirt. When Sherry and I first got married, she had a way of doing it that I'm sure worked fine, but it didn't work fine for me because they had to be folded. She'd fold them and set them off to the side. Again, being a loving wife, knowing that I was going to refold them anyway. <laughs> what makes her the best wife in the world, though, is over all these years, all, you know, we're almost we're, we're in our 20th year now being married. She has learned how to fold T-shirts like her crazy husband does, <laughs> and now she folds them the same way. Um, that is love, people. I don't care what you say. That is love. Uh, but but I mean little habit things that, that, that are part of my life. And I know that's crazy. I know none of you have anything like that that you do. Unless you'd like to share it right now, I'll just take a sip and pause. Go ahead. Is that where you fold the arms in? Mm -hmm. Where you can see the whole front of whatever's on the shirt or the back, depending on what it is. Yeah. We yeah. don't even have enough time. <laughs> so we are like, you fold t-shirts? <laughs> they just throw them in the, in the drawer. Look. I'm saying to go in. Oh, to go <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm going 
put them in drawers. There you go. You know what, Mr. JP? That's what I did until I worked at that stupid store. That's, <laughs> that's exactly what I did, and now I'm cursed. But we're all creatures of habit, and, and that's built into us in so many different ways, some very trivial like the ones we've been talking about, but some very serious. And some things that we do are good habits and, and, and good, good things that we do over and over and over again. Tradition is part of that being creatures of habit. Um, change is tough. Um, and the older we get, change is even tougher. Um, I think about some of the folks that we love dearly who are making transitions from being in their homes into an assisted living facility. That's tough after all the years that they've been taking care of so many other people. Um, that's hard. Change is hard. One of the issues, though, that we find is we're such creatures of habit that a lot of times in our life we will do what keeps us from having to change even if we come to a possible awareness that that thing's not the right thing to do anymore. Even when we see it not being effective for what we originally started doing it that way before, we, we understand that it's not as effective anymore, but we stay in that habit. And that's what's going on with these Pharisees. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how the Pharisees do get a very bad rap sometimes. Uh, and, and I think it's easy for us to look at them as the bad guys of the New Testament and always just trying to shut Jesus down and all that. They didn't understand. And so what did they do? They did what you and I do when we don't understand. They, were, they laid back on what they knew. And that's what Jesus is talking to them about here. The first thing that he says to them as these Pharisees and teachers of the law, these are the religious of the religious in the Jewish faith. These are the ones who are respected. These are the ones who are revered. These are the ones who, if they're not doing it right, and as Jesus is exposing that, they stand up to lose a lot of stature and a lot of power and a lot of uh, respect and things like that. So that's one reason they also respond the way that they do. But it says in verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. And they did just what we all do when we're in a crowd or doing something. You're doing it now. You're noticing, you know, well, so-and-so's got a new haircut or so-and-so bought a new sweater or so-and-so, you know, did this. Some of you, as you're looking right here, you can't see past this camera screen that we used to cover up for you. i got to start doing that again. It's distracting, right? And we, we just notice things, don't we? We see different stuff. And, and a lot of times we think that, you know, the things we notice are the most important thing in the room. And to us in the moment, sometimes they are. Uh, but but we, we notice things. And that's what they do. They know. It says some saw of his disciples eating food, uh, excuse me, and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Now in verse 3 uh, and, and, and 4, we get a, a parenthetical explanation of this, but, but remember that ritual cleansing was a big part of the Jewish faith. And, and part of that came from what God had given them in the law that set this up. So this wasn't some concept that they just invented on their own, but it is a concept and a following and a practice that they, that they placed a lot of extra value in, especially after years and years and years of practicing it. So the problem was the disciples of Jesus weren't washing as they should before they partook of a meal. Now remember that in Judaism, there was a large emphasis placed on being ritually ceremonially clean or unclean and there were steps that you have to take to be able to participate in temple worship and in, in daily life if you were considered to be um, ritually unclean if you had done things that led to being unclean eating certain foods were considered unclean dealing with certain people or certain substances would make you ceremonially unclean um, having a disease would make you ceremonially unclean. There were so many things in daily life that you and I would not think that way about in, in, for a moment that were big deals to them. So we get the parenthetical explanation here beginning in verse 3. He says the Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. Now, I don't mean that washing where your mom told you to go wash your hands and you ran and you know got two drops of water on each hand and you, you said you were done. A ceremonial washing, so again, a tradition, a pattern, something that had to be done and had to satisfy the expectation. Um, hold it, and they said that they did that, holding to the tradition of the elders. Verse 4 goes on to say, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, because the things that they had been out in, in the midst of and handling with their hands made them ceremonially unclean and needed to be washed. 
Now, this was before COVID hand washing was a thing, right? This was before all of that, you know, the thoughts about washing our hands that have come up in the last calendar year uh, were emphasized in this particular way. This had everything to do with a tradition that they tied spiritual value to um, that started off being what God said, but got exaggerated in a lot of ways. And that's what Jesus is going to be a, a, a approaching here and, and, and talking about. It says, and they observed many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So it didn't just deal with the person. It dealt with inanimate objects, too. It dealt with, with tools and instruments. If you go back into the Old Testament law, there were several, there, there's instructions there about how things are to be washed and how things are to be purified before they're used in temple worship by the priest or by anyone who would take place or take part in worshiping God. So these are things that are not just things they made up, but things that they um, we see get a little out of balance in the way that they emphasize it. Verse 5, we see, so, uh, so the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, up to this point, they're doing okay. <laughs> you know, They're seeing it, and they're like, well, that's not what we usually think about. We'll ask. Now, the problem comes in the way that we understand that they ask it. Now, just think about it, though, for a second. They're going to ask this in kind of a negative, derogatory type of way. Um, what do we do sometimes, though, when we see somebody not doing what they're supposed to do? We might go up to them and ask something, and we're asking a question. Well, I was just asking, but we ask it with a tone that's pretty accusatory, right? <laughs> you know, well, just uh, what would you say that you're doing here? <laughs> you know? I, what? I was just asking what they were doing, Miss Chris. I wouldn't be mean, right? But I, I'm inflecting. And, and we get the feeling, because of the way the Pharisees sometimes act, um, or oftentimes act in, in the Gospels, we get the feeling that's what's going on here. They say, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Now remember, they've heard about Jesus. They're threatened already by Jesus and their stature and their power and their standing. Um, they, they've heard him and been amazed, many of them probably already by this time, um, about his authority, the miracles that he's working. They've heard all kinds of things, if not seen them for themselves. Uh, and so it, it's kind of like if somebody came in here with uh, the, the perfect source for renewable energy and, and we got on them about, well, wait a minute, what kind of gas did you use in your car when you got here? You know, <laughs> you know they're, they're coming and they're, and they're giving us the answer to all of our problems, but we want to pick a nit, you know, about how they got here, you know. Uh, and so that's, that's what's going on here. They, they ask in such a way, well, wait a minute, why aren't they doing, why aren't your disciples doing what they're supposed to be doing? Why aren't they doing it the way we understand that you're supposed to do it in the way that we practice it? Jesus, in his answer, knows their heart and their motivation, just as he knows our hearts and motivations and everything that we do. In verse 6 we read, He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites as it was written. Now you might be reading this and go, man, that, that escalated quickly. <laughs> that, what just happened? They asked the question and Jesus called them hypocrites. Man, that is, that's big. Well, first off, the, the hypocritical um, stigma was not quite the same as what we think of. You know, we've talked about in different sermons and messages here lately how, you know, we'll, we'll agree to be a lot of things before we'll agree to be a hypocrite, even though we're all guilty of moments of, hypocr of hypocrisy. Um, but so when he says that, that sounds a little bit more harsh, but he's being pretty pointed with them. I mean, he's, he's telling them, and what's he doing? He doesn't speak it just from his to them, new way of understanding it, he goes back to what they know. He goes back into their tradition to explain to them about what should be being done with their tradition. He does the same thing to us and does the same thing with our hearts. Oftentimes, how does he, when does he convict us of something that needs to change in our life? When we're doing the things that we've always done for him. Sitting in a worship service, sitting in a Bible study, serving helping someone out, sharing the gospel with somebody. He teaches us about these things. So he's doing the same thing, working with these hearts, uh, the hearts of these, these Pharisees the same way. He's pointed, but he's still, of course, being Jesus. He says, uh, he says Isaiah was right when he uh, prophesied excuse me, uh, about you hypocrites, as it is written. He quotes Old Testament. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. What he's pointing out is that even in Isaiah's time and throughout time, when it came to following God's word, there was, just like we talked about this morning in the message, there was this idea of having a form of godliness but, but denying its power. 
there was this idea of being whitewashed tombs, uh, of being cups that were cleaned on the outside but were filthy on the inside. And that's what he's saying. He's, he's, he's quoting from their scripture to tell them, look, this isn't a problem that's new with my disciples. Let's talk about the real issue. And the real issue is the, the, not, the level of misunderstanding about what God expects and what God commands. He describes them, as, as Isaiah did, as people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's, that's the whole sign of that being a shell like we talked about this morning. The outside looks good. We say all the right things, but our motivation at the core is when the Bible speaks about, especially in the Old Testament, about our heart, it's the very core of our being. It's when everything else is stripped away, what's, what makes us us. It's our heart. It's our, our soul, if you will. It's, our, it's the, the, the essence of who we are. He says that their hearts are far from me. And so it's about not just going through religious motions and doing these practices, but it's about having a changed heart. Well, of course, that's going to be about what Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God in general and in specific uh, terms all the way through his ministry. But he's, he's taking this instance to share this with them and to, to correct them, uh, to rebuke them, sure, but to correct them. He also says, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. When does tradition get out of whack? When the rule of what we do is more important than the reason why we do it. Anytime, whether it's about the style of music that we do uh, to, to, to worship the Lord, whether it's about how, you know, what time our worship services or our Bible studies or our fellowships are, uh, whether it's about where we meet, uh, who's there, what we wear, all this stuff, we, we have expectations of, of, you know, common decency and things like that that are right to have. But, but in the middle of all of that, we can't let the how we do it be more important than the why we do it. Something that's very, uh, been very popular here in, the, in recent years in talking uh, with businesses and, and motivational speakers is this idea of remembering your why. Not just what do you do, but why do you do what you do. And that's what Jesus is getting to here. He says in verse 8, he says, You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Folks, that's one of the worst things that can be said from the Lord about one of his churches is that we're more concerned, or any church would be more concerned with human traditions than we are with the word and the commands of God. Um, that's why it's so important, as we always talk about, that we always look back to what does the word of God say about this? Not what does Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so or Brother So-and-so or any other So-and-so say about it, think about it. It's okay to consider those things, but when we're making our ultimate decisions, when we're setting our policies, when we're, when we're charting uh, the course to follow God's will going forward and things, we've got to look back at God's word, not at these, any human traditions. Now, if it's human traditions that are following and, and are bearing fidelity to God's word, then that's a great tradition and we should keep them up. But if they're not, if it's more important to keep the tradition than it is to do what God says, then we're out of whack. And that's the worst thing, I think, that, that God could say about a church. Because the very next thing that comes out of, after a pattern of, of putting human traditions above God's word in the church, is that dreaded word of Ichabod, where he looks at the church and says, no, that church is dead in the faith. They're, they're not serving the way they're supposed to be. So he's telling them this. I mean, he's, he's laying it out there for them. And, and in verse 9, kind of like when guys, our wives, have a few things that they need to tell us and make sure we understand, it seems like they have another thing and another thing. It says in verse 9, it says, And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Whew. Man, especially, this is so hurtful and so terrible because their traditions were only traditions in the beginning. <laughs> to be able to obey the commands of God. It's not just, uh, if, this, if he had been saying this to the local, you know, Satan worshiping group, well, that would have been one thing, because that's what they set out to do in the beginning. But here he's talking to the people who are priding themselves on following God's commands, and he's exposing the problem that what you think you're doing, what you're dedicating so much time and so many resources towards, and, and what you're spending just all kinds of energy trying to do, is the opposite of what you're doing. It'd be kind of like, man, you know, I want to get healthy. I want to lose weight. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat as many Cheetos as I can and sit on the couch for as long as I can each and every day. Amen. I mean, Amen. if that worked, first off, if that had worked, you'd be looking at a, at a 
bikini model up here uh, because I've tried that and it doesn't work, by the way, uh, especially during COVID. I think I've tried that more than any time in my life, but uh, it doesn't help. <laughs> but, but if that's something that somebody really believed was going that way, somebody would need to tell them, hey, I don't think this is going to get it. <laughs> you know, I don't think this is the right way to go. And that's the sad part about this with the Pharisees is they think that they're doing right. In fact, they'll fight you about it. They will, they'll condemn you if you say different. And they're trying to do that here with Jesus' disciples. Jesus brings up another example. He says, for Moses said, again, going back to the law that they claim and pride themselves on following. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But, and then Jesus speaks to a practice that they would have done where if someone had, you know, evidenced a calling of God, they were now deemed to be so important in, in the following of God that they, somebody else could take care of their parents so they could go take care of the stuff of God. That's not really what God has intended, right? He says, but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, and the word Corbin meaning this practice that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Now look, my calling as a minister, my calling as a pastor, 100% does not absolve my responsibility from honoring my father and mother. It doesn't. It won't. In fact, if, if I'm not careful, I, I could find myself very much at odds with God's will for my life if I said that my ministry is more important than honoring my parents because my first ministry is to follow God's word and God's word says to honor your father and mother. And that's exactly what Jesus is pointing out here. By the same token, if I did a great job pastoring Harrisville Baptist Church but did a terrible job honoring my wife and raising and honoring my two girls, I'd be out of God's will. Wouldn't matter how many people came to our church, wouldn't matter how many people got saved when it came to what I would be judged for because, again, God has set up the institution of the family to be an example and to be a practice arena for what we do in our relationship with him. And so he's saying, look, you can't say that you're all about honoring God when you yourself have set up this practice that circumvents that. And, and sadly, like a lot of religions, like a lot of faiths, the Jewish faith was filled and, and, and sometimes still is, like Baptists are, <laughs> with saying, man, well, no, we believe this wholeheartedly, but, but we kind of work around it in this way when we have to, you know? But in the real world, but, but when we have, need to do this other thing, we, you know? And so that's what he said. He's pointing out the inconsistency here. He says, uh, when, when you say that uh, something is, is Corbin, then, then that you don't let them do anything for their father and mother. And in verse 13, he says, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And he says, and you do many things like that. What he's exposing here, as they're accusing him of breaking God's word, he's exposing that they don't understand God's word to be able to enforce it amongst other people. And that's never the part that God called us to play of enforcing the way other people practice God's word. He calls each and every one of us to trust his word and then to live in it, to show our trust in it. And then he brings us together with like-minded people so that we can have iron sharpening iron and growth happen and synergy happen and, and, and teamwork and, and family ministry going on and, and all the things that he calls us to. Again, it says, again in verse 14, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, he's speaking addressing specifically the Pharisees, and now he's now addressing the whole crowd. He's not just talking to the Pharisees, he's talking to everybody. And he's covering this understanding, this broader idea of the importance of our heart compared to the over-importance that we place on our outside appearance. And he said again, let me read it to you one more time in verse 14. He says, or excuse me, verse 15, nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. He's saying in a nutshell, it's not about the stuff out here that God is judging. God judges the heart. What do we see when the prophet is, is, is trying to find the next king that God has anointed for his kingdom? 
Man looks at the outward appearance, but what? God looks at the heart. That's what Jesus is teaching here, that same concept. It says in verse 17, After he had left the crowd near the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Not just the Pharisees, not just the, the bad guys that didn't get it. His own disciples, our apostles, also had trouble with this. This is why Jesus is teaching them as he goes. And in teaching, he asks a great question. Are you so dull? <laughs> How can you not get this is pretty much what he's saying. He's saying, look, you need, to, you need to pay attention. You need to understand, and you need to be willing to change. He says, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? He repeats himself. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. Now, we won't go into the biology lesson or the anatomy and physiology lesson, Miss Ethel, here, that tells us what he's talking about here. He's speaking in an in a instance or in a picture of, of eating and, and, and the digestive system. We'll just leave it at that right there. And what he's, and now, we, we all know that we can eat something bad if, if some of that shrimp we were just talking about had not been right, then, then that does cause problems. So it's not that what we eat isn't important, but it doesn't have the spiritual difference-making power that was being prescribed to him or ascribed to him by the Pharisees. He, and again, we get another little parenthetical explanation here. It says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now remember, in, in Mark's time when he's writing this, and in the decades to come, and even longer than that, really, but especially in the time of, of, of the first century when the New Testament is being written that we are blessed with, what you ate and what you didn't eat as a Christian was a big concern. It created dissension in churches. It created dissension amongst the apostles. It created, I mean, relationship-breaking dissension amongst a lot of people. It was a big, big problem in the church. And so Mark's part of, you know, he's contemporary to this. He's in that century, and so it's already being a part of, of the issue. And so, so he's writing this after this has happened, right? He's not just standing there and writing it down as it happened. He's giving an account later on. So it's interesting that even in Mark's gospel, we get this, this treatment of this idea. But we see that it comes from not Paul's opinion or Peter's opinion or one of the other apostles or disciples' opinions, but it comes from the teaching of Jesus himself. He said, "Food to, for it doesn't go into their heart, but in their stomach. Does God judge our stomach? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> because he's going to look at me and go, man, we could have fed a lot of people with all the stuff you put in yours. <laughs> we could have wiped out half the county's you know, <laughs> famine you know, to, just in what you ate, Rich. You know, he judges our heart. And what he's getting to the point here, and let me, let me finish reading the, the, this part of the passage before I tell you the point. It says, he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these things that are done on the outside, where do they start? On the inside. Jesus is saying, don't assume that just because you're following a bunch of rules that you have decided are so important that you're honoring our Heavenly Father. He says, no, let your heart be changed. Let your heart be right. If your heart is right, then you're, you are right. And if your heart is right, then it doesn't matter whether you eat something that's clean or unclean. It's about your heart. Now, will your heart being right with the Lord determine how you go about eating or drinking or doing or any of these other things? Absolutely. Will it keep you from, if your heart is right in the Lord, from sexual immorality, theft, murder, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? You better believe it. But it doesn't start with just saying, well, I don't do these things, so I must be right with God. It says, no, I have a relationship with God through Christ, and I'm following him, and so therefore I don't do these things. Uh, Y'all know that, that food's a big problem for me in my life as far as what I eat and how much I eat of it and the types of things I eat. Um, I don't have a problem nor a temptation when it comes to alcohol. Not, not a bit. Not, not, I mean, and I don't say that haughtily or arrogantly because Lord knows that temptation can come on me tonight, you know. But up to this point in my life, alcohol is not an issue for rich. I'm not tempted by it. I don't like it. I don't like, you know, in my, in my teenage years when I found out what it would do to you, didn't really like what it did to me. Didn't help. I only drank to be popular and drinking made me do stuff that made me not be popular. So it didn't, it didn't do it for me. So therefore, I, did, I, I didn't mess with it for a long time, and now I don't care anything for it. 
But I don't not drink and think, well, hey, I don't drink, so I must be okay. I don't drink because it doesn't help me honor the Lord. Now, I'd love to be able to say that that's why I don't do any of the things I don't do and why I do the things I do is because they all help me honor the Lord. But on that one particular issue, that's not a, that's not a big area of temptation for me. That's not true of everybody. Some people, it's a, it's a huge temptation for them. It's something that they've dealt with on and off throughout their lives or will deal with it in the future. But the point is, is that it's not so much about labeling and getting into the individual things because it all comes back to our heart. The last verse we read says, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. This evening, if we're right with the Lord, it's because our heart has been made right with the Lord. If we're not yet right with the Lord, it's because our heart has not yet been made right with the Lord. It's not because we go to church. It's not because we vote a certain way. It's not because we say things or do things. It's because of where our heart is. And so what Jesus is telling these Pharisees and, and what he's telling us as we read this passage is that he deals with the very core of who we are. And from the core of who we are, he changes all the superficial things that people see. He doesn't want us to fix all the superficial and then work up one day to him actually getting to change our whole heart. He wants to change our whole heart and then take the rest of our lives perfecting the things that we do. We have to make sure that we're not leaning on our own understanding or our own traditions or our own teachings, and we make sure that we catch that. And when we minister to people in our community and in our workspace and in our families and, and wherever we are, in our schools for, you know, for the kids, and when, when we're ministering there, we've got to know that we're not working just to change people's behavior. We're helping them to see that our hearts have been changed and therefore to let God inspire them to let them or to, to let their hearts be changed by him. It's about heart change. It's not just about behavior. It's not just about following traditions. It's about following the word of God and doing exactly what he says. Let me pray for us this evening. Lord God, we're thankful, Father, that you concern yourself, even in the least, with our hearts. Our hearts trick us and fool us in so many ways, but they don't trick you. They don't fool you. We know, Father, that you are desirous to, to save and to change and to grow our hearts to look more and more like yours. Lord God, for those that have been a part of this Bible study, help that to be the process that we're a part of by first trusting in Jesus and continuing to trust in him and our relationship with you through him to let you change our hearts. God, make our hearts right. And Father, until our hearts are right, don't let us be so caught up in the things we do. Because Lord, we know in all truth and reality, we won't be able to do it right until you've changed our heart to make our hearts right. God, help us also to be active in the process that you are, that you are doing, that you are working in helping others come to have heart change as well. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Continue to change our hearts all to your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, folks, I hope that y'all have a wonderful evening. I was about four minutes over. Sorry. <laughs>